Is it okay? Yeah. So, <clears throat> okay. So, welcome everyone to the first uh, weekly colloquium series for the School of Astrophysics for this upcoming semester. And uh, it is it is hectic, but it's fun to ha have the first colloquium right within the period when we are having our final examinations and grading. So that proves the spirit uh, of our colleagues and students that nothing can stop us from you know doing like constant activity. That's great, and we are very happy to have Dr. Mukul Bhattacharya as a speaker today from Penn State University. So Mukul did his undergraduate studies uh, at ISC and he was part of the first batch under the four-year undergraduate program that ISC started back in 2011. And then from ISC, he went to University of Texas at Austin uh, where he completed his PhD. Uh, I would say high energy astrophysics, particle physics, uh, you know, overlapping area. And then uh, I think he completed he completed his PhD in 2020 within the pandemic. And then he went for a postdoc position to Virginia Tech, the joint postdoc position between Virginia Tech and Penn State University. And after spending a year at Virginia Tech, is now at the State College, uh, Pennsylvania State University. And there's a very interesting title of his talk. So he's going to tell us about heavy element nucleosynthesis and high energy neutrinos from magnetized outputs. So let's uh, welcome Dr. Bhattacharya and, and let's hear this. Uh, let's, yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. So maybe we can have the video. Video to the organ. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, so as you see, today I will be talking about nuclear sensors and magnetized outflows, uh, predominantly in core collapse supernovae, but also in the case of binary mergers, can be black hole neutron star mergers or binary neutron star mergers. So before I start out, I would like to thank my collaborators, both at Penn State at Virginia Tech, where I did my postdoc. Uh, so my current advisor, Kota Murase, and his graduate student, Jose Carpio, and my previous advisor, Shinsaku, and his graduate student, Nikkei Tango, with whom most of this work has been done. That's not connected? Okay. Yeah, I, I can just use this one directly. Yeah. So this is a brief outline of my talk, uh, what I will be talking about today. So. I'll be focusing mostly on how different nuclei are produced, uh, starting from lighter nuclei, which is hydrogen, helium, then going on to intermediate nuclei, which is lithium, beryllium, up to uh, carbon, oxygen, and then heavy nuclei, which is iron and anything that is heavier than that. I'll be talking about the sites where these nuclei can be synthesized. So can be again core collapse or binary mergers. And then I'll be focusing on core collapse. So these objects are called protomagnetars and the winds are driven by neutrinos. So I'll be talking about neutrino driven winds from these objects. And then I talk about results, which we get from our code, which is Skynet. So that's, that's a code that we use to generate the nuclei abundances in these systems. Uh, and then I move on to how these heavy nuclei, once they are synthesized within these stars, they can get accelerated within those stars and whether they can survive or not, because the only way that we can see those nuclei is if they survive within the source, propagate to Earth, and once we observe them. And lastly, uh, talking about propagation again, we have to talk about propagation within the progenitors, uh, which are also GRB progenitors, gamma ray burst progenitors. Uh, and we want to talk about how these outflows are modified as they are moving within those GRB progenitors and whether there's a promise for detection of neutrinos from these sources. So I'll just start out with a brief outline of the periodic table. As you see, uh, this is something that we are taught about a lot when we are uh, studying uh, elemental chemistry, let's say. Uh, there are a lot of nuclei here. As I said, hydrogen and helium are the uh, lighter nuclei that we look at. 
So there are five processes mainly here. Uh, Big Bang nucleosynthesis, AGB stars, core collapse supernovae, uh, type 1 supernovae, and mergers. So as you will see, hydrogen and helium, most of them are produced through Big Bang nucleosynthesis. That's why most of them, most of these boxes look black. For the other nuclei, which are heavier, you can see more shades of blue and green. So more blue means more synthesis through core collapse supernovae, and more green means AGB stars and so on. So our goal has been to see if this uh, table is still consistent because we want to add additional processes to this. We just don't want to restrict ourselves to these five processes. We also want to look at magnetorotational supernova and not just neutron star mergers, but black hole neutron star mergers with them. So I'll come back to this slide and we will look back at how this gets modified once we include the results from our analysis. And this is a table from just two years ago, two to three years ago. So this is a rapidly evolving field, as you will see. Yeah, yeah so uh, really good question. I should have said that the x-axis is actually the time axis. So it's zero to 13.8 billion years. So this is increasing means it starts from somewhere, then it picks up. So that's why the white part. So lighter nuclei, uh, hydrogen and helium was mostly created post Big Bang. Uh, so what happened was once uh, the Big Bang happened, which was somewhere here, and the universe started cooling down, uh, the electron fraction, which is YE here, uh, initially started out from 0.5, which means equal number of electrons and equal number of neutrons and protons because it's uh, charge neutral. But as temperatures started dropping, because protons are lighter, neutrons were decaying into protons, which means the fraction of protons increases, the fraction of neutrons decreases because the number of protons is the same as number of electrons, net charge is zero. YE, which is the electron fraction of electrons has to increase. So it increased from 0.5 to 7 over 8, eventually, by the time we reach somewhere here. And then after that, we got about 75% of hydrogen and 25% of helium uh, from this Big Bang nucleosynthesis. But as we know, we have a lot more nuclei than hydrogen and helium. So where did the rest of it come from? Uh, the next thing is intermediate nuclei, which is lithium to iron. And most of it we know can come from uh, stellar fusion uh, in most of the stars that we see. It can be sun or it can be even heavier stars than the sun. So we know that elements of two iron can be formed by nuclei fusion within these stars, whatever the extreme conditions are for pressure and temperature, they support it. Uh, and these stars suffer mass loss events. They can be flares, so sudden outbursts of energies or pulsations or uh, supernovae explosions. And the material from the star breaks out and it disperses throughout the universe. So that's how we see heavier nuclei than hydrogen or helium at the Earth, because it would have been formed at some star, and then it just traveled to Earth through any of these events that we have here. And the next uh, set of nuclei, which is the heavy nuclei, which would be the main focus of the rest of my talk, are created through two different processes. The first one is slow neutron capture process, which is the S process. Uh, so I'm showing uh, the S process here. As you see, it would start from somewhere here, which is the AGB stage, and then it goes, it's post-AGB. So it occurs in late stages of stellar evolution because AGB is the third or fourth stage of stellar evolution. It doesn't really kick in before that. But the reason it's called slow process, S for slow, is because the intermediate nuclei, uh, they, are, uh, they act as C nuclei, but there are not as many free neutrons in these systems. So uh, there are not as many neutrons to capture because heavy nuclei are getting created as neutrons are getting captured to the seed nuclei. Hydrogen plus a neutron gives lithium. Lithium plus a neutron gives beryllium and so on. But in these systems, there are not as many free neutrons, firstly, and then those free neutrons are also decaying. So as heavy nuclei are formed, they are decaying back into lighter nuclei. So it's a very slow process and it cannot give us the periodic table that we looked at. So there's definitely more to the story. 
The next one that is the main focus is R process, which is rapid process, R for rapid. So this is a rapid neutron capture process and the seed nuclei captures neutrons much faster in this case compared to the slow neutron process from the previous slide. Uh, as a comparison, in this case, there can be 100 neutron capture events per second, whereas for uh, slow neutron capture events, it's just few for 10 to 100 years. So part of this text is overlapping, I think, because change of format, but I'll just spell out and let me know if there's something that needs more clarification. So there's this is basically an equation where neutron converts to proton, and this was a proton to neutron conversion equation. So this uh, animation is showing as we start from 0.5 seconds. So start of nucleosynthesis is at 0.5 seconds. It continues until about 100 seconds. You would first see formation here. It moves towards the right and towards the bottom, and then it moves back to this black line. So this black line is where most of the stable nuclei are. So initially, nucleosynthesis happens. It's going this way. Then it's decaying back to the black line, which we are seeing, which is basically the periodic table line. Sorry, yeah. that's, that's the number of protons. This one, yes. Number of protons versus number of neutrons. Okay. So this is telling as the time is increasing, how is the abundance in different nuclei? Uh, let's say iron would be somewhere here, 26, 30. It's changing. This is the time of the Okay, so this is the time in our uh, simulation. I should have been clearer, yes. Yeah, so it's it's from the start of nucleosynthesis until the time it ends. And it's typically few seconds to few hundred seconds. So it, it eventually all decays back to this solid line, which is the stable nuclei. Uh, the, rest of, the rest of it is all isotopes, which have small half-lives, so they can't survive. And what is the patch that is in the, this one? The blue, the blue thing oh, the this is actually a band within which uh, the neutron to proton number is permitted. So outside that, we do not have. So there's energetic uh, considerations beyond that. It's it's roughly there, but there are very small uh, wiggles. There are very small fluctuations around that line. So if I were to fit a mean line here, yes. it would look and like as input. Yes. yes. Yeah. Roughly like one inch, one inch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, around that Yes. Yeah. When the neutron goes to proton, mm -hmm. the neutron? So the neutron plus an electron neutrino would create a proton plus an electron. Oh, so this would be uh, in within the, so if you are looking at magnetars, this is uh, generated once uh, the shock wave goes out, and then the surface of the protomagnetar is uh, heated by neutrinos, which are generated by through some residual events. We do not really look into that, but I'll come to that, the mechanism of core collapse, which is generating these uh, neutrinos. This is, yes. So, uh, when we have the abundance patterns, if you are looking at the periodic table, we need to compare it with something. Uh, it has to be something that we can observe. So the left panel here is the solar abundance. This is the abundance that we see in the sun. Uh, x-axis is mass number. So uh, essential difference between these two axes is x-axis here is mass number. This is atomic number, so slightly different. But at least we can see three important things here. There are three peaks uh, for the sun, one around 80 to 90, the other around 130, the other around 190. So we call them R process peaks. This is the first, second, third peak. And we try to explain how do, how do we get which of these peaks in the sun. Uh, whatever abundance pattern we produce from Skynet, which is a code we, code we use, should be explaining this uh, these peaks. The abundance numbers should roughly match around the mass numbers wherever we see the peaks. And then there is a different class of stars, which are called ultra metal poor stars. They are very different from the sun because they are not enriched as much as the sun in the extent of their stellar evolution. 
So their abundance pattern is somewhat different. You can see 40 has a peak and then there's a peak around 55 or so, and then there's 80. So this looks different from that, but what we want to achieve is it can explain both these patterns well to some extent, our results, that is our goal. Because we observe both of these in nature, it's not just one or the other. So again, coming back to the question, where can our processes happen? Of course, it's neutron capture, that's the first step. So there has to be a lot of neutrons in the system, firstly. Then neutron capture has to happen at a certain pace. It has to be rapid because we see a lot of nuclei and we know the age of the universe. So to get so many nuclei, the neutrons have to be captured at a certain rate. And this can only happen if the medium is hot and dense. Uh, if it's cold and uh, very rare, then the nuclei do not uh, interact enough. So there's not enough nuclear synthesis which happens within a certain time. So bringing all these conditions together, there are three kinds of system which we can look at. Uh, core collapse supernovae, the one to the left, uh, Bani neutron star merger, uh, both neutron stars, and a Bani neutron star merger with a black hole. So I'll first go over this, and then I'll include these other two in the picture and talk about how they help the nucleosynthesis picture or what gaps they are actually filling in in our physical model. So now coming on to the uh, mechanism of core collapse supernova, what happens is uh, every star would have uh, these uh, mass shell layers and then iron is initially fused in the core of these stars. They can be eight solar mass, they can be different solar mass progenitors. Uh, as iron starts fusing, the radiation pressure also uh, decreases gradually because iron is stable. So there's uh, less and less energy uh, that's getting released eventually as we move to iron. And once the radi radiation pressure is decreasing, the star is collapsing onto itself. So here we see that the star has collapsed. It's a 1.4 solar mass core. So it started from eight, it has gone down to 1.4 and then Neutrinos are produced from this process. So maybe I, I think that answers the question partially. So this is where this neutrino pops out and the, this star, which whatever is left of it becomes neutron degenerate. And then eventually there's a, a material bounce off the core and this whole yellow region, uh, the light yellow and the dark yellow region is pushed out with a shock wave. And as the shock wave goes out, all the material is ejected and what we are left with is just the neutron star with a surface, or it can be a black hole with a surface, depending on whatever the mass is. If it's much heavier than 1.4 solar mass, the core, it becomes a black hole. Otherwise, it's a neutron star. If it's a neutron star, then we see neutrinos coming out of it. So that's a smoking gun. If we see neutrinos after core collapse, it's most likely a neutron star, and it's not a black hole. So that's a distinct uh, a distinguishing factor. So this figure is uh, quite detailed. I'll ex try to explain simply what it is. So the x-axis is the mass axis. The y-axis is the radius axis. The radius goes from about 10 kilometers to 100,000 kilometers. And the mass is going from 1.4 solar mass, which is the mass of the core, uh, to about three solar mass. And it is showing what nuclei are formed in which radius as the nuclei are moving out. So. Once the neutrinos are hitting the surface of the star, they are generating the shock wave, which is moving out. And that's carrying the protons and neutrons outward with the wave. And nucleosynthesis is also occurring within the outflow as the outflow is going out gradually. And this figure is just showing which nuclei are getting created where. So neutrons and protons are created initially, then it's beryllium, carbon, and eventually we see nickel, silicon, helium, oxygen getting created um, mm -hmm. in the outer regions of the outflow. Is there any reason for that? Is there any reason why nuclei are getting produced? Why heavier nuclei are getting produced outside? Oh, it's, uh, so there's a balance between the entropy and the expansion time scale. So as the material is expanding, there's this recombination temperature, which has to be reached for every nuclei. And it is different. So this recombination temperature is a function of the entropy and expansion time scale, which is a function of radius. So initially, the recombination temperature is sufficient to generate the lighter nuclei. But as we move outward, the recombination temperature is such that 
even heavier nuclei can form gradually. So the radius increase is helping in some way in that process. And here is the picture that we consider a very simplified version of this. So this neutron star is somewhere in the middle here. It has a radius of R and it has the magnetic field axis, the dashed axis here, and it, it has a rotation axis, the omega axis here. So there are a lot of uh, symbols here. I'll just explain. M dot is the mass loss rate from the surface of the magnetar. So how fast is this mass moving out is calculated through this. It's a function of the neutrino quantities, the neutrino luminosity energy, the radius of the star, the mass of the star. And then each of these quantities are modified, uh, the luminosity energy, the time, because we take it from non-rotating protomagnetars. And in our model, we have rotation included. So we include a stretch factor, which is eta, which we take to be three, but essentially it's a function of rotation rate. So that's one simplistic assumption that we make, but it's actually very useful. Uh, now, coming to the protomagnetar wind properties. So protomagnetars, again, as I said, are predominantly core collapse systems. So they are still not mergers in any way. They have different properties. One of them is magnetization of the outflow, which is sigma zero here. It depends on the magnetic flux, the rotation rate, the mass loss rate. Uh, this is the contour plot of magnetization as a function of magnetic field, which goes from 10 to the 14 to 10 to the 16. And the spin period goes from about one to five solar mass. So as you see, the magnetization is the highest for the largest magnetic field, but somewhat slower rotation. It's about four. It's not the slowest, but it's somewhere in between. And the energy loss rate, which is E dot, which is mostly magnetic because these are all magnetized outflows, uh, is dominated by sigma zero. So it's proportional to sigma zero. This is getting maximized somewhere here large b and very small p. Very small p means very rapid omega. So it's rotating very fast and the field is very strong. So it's energetically giving out more and more uh, energy uh, in, in luminosity of the outflow. So we see that successful jets are possible mostly in this parameter range, which is more than 10 to the 16 cows and less than two milliseconds. And the next plot is actually showing the other parameters, which is the entropy of the wind, the energy loss rate with the expansion time scale. So, yeah. This is the milliseconds, yeah. How is this contour plot generated? So we vary uh, P, which would go into omega, and we vary B, which is going into phi b. And both of those would generate sigma zero, but there's a spin down, which is also happening. So p, p I should clarify this is p zero. So it's the initial p. And then as the protomagnetar is spinning down, that p is gradually slowing down. So that gives us this pattern, or else it would just be a fixed line pattern. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Protomagnetar is uh, yes. After after that, so once the core collapse happens, it it stays in the protomagnetar stage for uh, at least few hundred seconds, and then it transforms to something. Yes. And then. Parameters. For example, F open, that's awesome. Okay, so F open is uh, geometrically uh, the fraction of the neutron star which is open to magnetic field lines. So that depends on what B is. And F centrifugal depends on both B and omega. So these are prefactors, but these are implicitly dependent on either B or omega. Yeah. So the figure here on the right is actually showing the entropy uh, in blue. So as we see, the entropy isn't changing much. It's pretty much constant through the 100 seconds that we look at. And then the expansion time scale is increasing from about 60 to somewhere like uh, 10,000. So it's increasing. But the advantage that we find with magnetized outflows is the entropy isn't as high as thermal outflows. And the expansion time scale also for 
the major part of it is not very large as for thermal core collapse events. So that both of them actually help out in nucleosynthesis. And we are finding more and more nuclei, heavier nuclei being formed than thermal processes. So in that case, we wouldn't have as high a magnetic field as we have in this case. Uh, what would happen is we would fall outside that 10 to the 14 to 10 to the 16 Gauss range. And I'll be explaining that the mass fraction of heavy nuclei from that magnetic field wouldn't be sufficient to explain the nuclei abundances that we saw in the periodic table initially. So adding magnetic field is helping us getting there. Uh, but we cannot say it's just that picture. We can say magnetic field is a helpful component in achieving nuclear synthesis. Uh, this partly says gap pulse are like objects are not as promising. We are not ruling them out. The yes, about ten to the fourteen, which is that for magnetars. So, for nuclear synthesis to happen in the wind in the first place, there has to be free neutrons because the nuclei are capturing the neutrons and becoming heavier gradually. If there has to be free neutrons, whatever is initially in the jet, in the outflow, has to disintegrate. And there are just two processes which do that. One is photo disintegration and spallation, primarily. So this figure is showing the optical depth for photo disintegration, pH, and spallation in S SP. And as you will see, both of them are much, much greater than one for the entirety of 100 seconds, which means everything that is loaded into the outflow is getting disintegrated much faster because tau much much greater than one means disintegration is very rapid tau much less than one means they are surviving so it's the case where they are not surviving they are generating uh, neutrons and then these neutrons are participating in nuclear synthesis xh here is the mass fraction of heavier nuclei and by heavier nuclei i mean anything which is heavier than iron so 26 number of protons 30 number of neutrons or more massive. So Fe, Co, Ni, and so on. So as you see, we are varying the mass, uh, we are varying the electron fracture, fraction here from 0.4 to 0.5 to 0.6. And Xh is actually the maximum. Xh equals one means all the nuclei that are getting generated are heavier than iron. And Xh equals 0.65 means about 60, 65% of the nuclei are heavier than iron. The other 35% are lighter than iron. So for smaller YE, we get more heavier nuclei synthesized because the blue line is around one. The red line is below. So larger the number for YE, smaller the nuclear synthesis. Uh, this is one correlation we can establish, but this is using uh, analytical expression, which is this one. And I, as I will establish, this isn't the best estimate. This gives us an overestimate. That's why we need to move to a numerical uh, code, which is Skynet, to actually simulate all these reactions and not depend on analytical formula because this is about 2014 or 2012. So it's already dated and there has been improvements on that. Yeah. Yes. So we just add the masses of all the nuclei. Uh, it's it's uh, A of I divided by sigma AI. So mass in... Oh no, that's that's not including the neutron star mass. That's just in the outflow. Yes. Roughly, yes. So for a 1.4 solar mass, it's about 0.1 or so. Can I just compare this one? Mm -hmm. The 16 is the energy star. Yes, that, that is something that we actually do. So we will go and compare this with the abundance in sun or ultra metal poor stars. And then we will see if it's matching roughly or not. So practically, this is a larger amount of hydrogen oxide. There's a, yes, there is a mix. There is a contamination, uh, which is affecting our conclusions. We still do not know how to exclude that, but yes, there, there is a contamination from nuclei which are heavier for some stars more than the others. So yeah, that's right. 
Yeah, just tell on you, the, uh, uh, the uh, Yes. That will eventually decrease as the yes. Close to the star. So what we produce here, now we are in the process of propagating those nuclei within the ISM. So that's with another code, which is CR proper. That will add all those effects and tell us how this XH is decreasing as these heavier nuclei are moving within the ISM towards the Earth. So this is still near source. This is still close to the protomagnetar. We are not further than that 10 to the five kilometers. We are still within that distance at this point. So this is the contour plot for uh, the mass fraction in heavier nuclei, XH, and T breakout is about 10 seconds for most of the stars. It's the breakout time, the time when the jet is coming out of the stellar ejecta. And this is the neutrino thin time when the, when the stellar ejecta is thin enough to permit the neutrinos to go out of it. So we see similar pattern in both of these. Most of the red region where most heavier nuclei are produced are on the lower left. So rapid rotation, but slower magnetic fields. Same for time t equals tb0 and time t equals neutrino thin time. But I'll come to this later and I'll show that this trend is actually reversed when we use the code Skynet. So that's one disadvantage of this, of using this analytical expression is it is underestimating nucleosynthesis in this region. You'll find out that it's not orange or yellow, but it's more red here. So coming to Skynet, which is a code we use, it has three input parameters, the density, temperature, and electron fraction. So once we provide the density and temperature, it gives us the nucleosynthesis yield, uh, which is determined by YE, and it has about 8,000 nuclei in, in its database and about 100,000 reactions that we can use. And we can make very precise predictions for elemental abundances. In the next slide, I'm showing uh, these abundance patterns, which uh, we are getting from Skynet. We are providing the density, temperature, and electron fraction, and then we are getting these abundance patterns. We can see where the peaks are. This is for core collapse again. This is for a given electron fraction of 0.45, but at different times. So T start is 0.5 seconds. Breakout is about 10 seconds. Photo disintegration is about Gamma, this is photo disintegration, that's about 40, 50 seconds, and Emax is about 70, 80 seconds. So we see as the time increases going from blue to red, heavier nuclei are getting formed more. On average, there's a flip in trend in the end, but on average, there are heavier nuclei formed more as we move later in the star, uh, later in the outflow. But if we were to fix the time and change YE, we will see what we had already seen before, which is smaller YE is giving slightly more heavier nuclei than larger YE of 0.55. So protomagnetars can produce weak R process elements, which is around A equals 60, but it doesn't give us much around A equals 120 or beyond. So it drops here. It gives us 60 and 90, but it doesn't give us beyond that. So there's definitely something else which is going on, which we needed to look at. This is the contour plot of the mass number of nuclei that is synthesized. This is the average mass number. So as you see, the average mass number is going up to roughly 35 or 40. So it's still not going up to 60, which is the first R process peak that we saw in that abundance pattern. And again, as I told with the analytical expression, we had more red on the left-hand side, but now left bottom, but now we are seeing more red in the right bottom. So. In this case, higher magnetic fields are actually helping nucleosynthesis. Analytical expression was telling us something exactly the opposite. So this is a correction to that. And now we know that this is correct. And uh, more rapid rotation is was helping then, it's still helping now. Yeah. So there's an uh, where we're going in the analytical expression is wrong is that we can now take care of the and get the Okay, so there was an overestimate in centrifugal acceleration, which happens if you have very high field and very rapid rotation. So the analytical expression, what it was doing is it was saying us more material is flung out of the neutron star than it actually is. 
What Skynet does is it self-consistently includes the physics and it says, no, some of that material actually stays. It participates in nucleosynthesis and it gives us more heavier nuclei in the larger B, smaller B range. Is this code yes, it's a publicly available code. Yeah. So now I'm going from nucleosynthesis to nuclei acceleration and survival. So one thing we know is, yes, these nuclei are produced, but do these give us cosmic rays or not is the bigger question. So for that, we will have to see whether these can be accelerated to energies like 10 to the 19, 10 to the 20, 10 to the 21 EV. And also we need to see whether they survive. So the X, the Y axis here is Emax, uh, 10 to the 21, the solid lines are the energy lines and the dashed lines here is, are the optical depth lines. So this is the optical depth for photo disintegration. If it is less than one, which is this, then the nuclei survives. Anything within this white region is where the nuclei is surviving and also where the solid line is over 10 to the 20 EV. So we get cosmic rays. We have promised for getting cosmic rays because we have at least the minimum energy that is needed for cosmic rays. And also the nuclei are getting formed and they are not getting disintegrated. So there's a chance for us to see to see them. And comparing all the processes, this right, process, this right panel is telling us that photo disintegration is the most important disintegration process. There are a few other processes. I wouldn't go into details for all of those, but these other two or three processes are actually subdominant. The black region, which is GDR, photo disintegration, is actually the predominant. Right. Okay, so that's the maximum that we could achieve within the range of B and P that we considered. It's a possibility that if there was stronger field than that, then the energy can go higher. But this is the most that we could get within our parameter space. Uh, so there's an upper limit on the magnetic field through the uh, in the proto uh, mechanism itself, which is about three times ten to the sixteen. So if the magnetic field is larger than that, then it's not uh, stable. The structure of the star isn't stable. So that gives us the upper limit. Now, if there's a different object which is contributing, if it's not a proto magnetar, then we do not have that upper limit. But if you are considering proto magnetars, we are just going with that. So now I'm recapping a bit core collapse supernovae. We know that they can produce uh, heavy nuclei, they cannot produce as much heavy nuclei. It's still weak our process. They can give us energies, which is about 10 to the 21 EV. Uh, the low entropy and expansion time scales is actually helping us in getting the heavier nuclei, but we still do not know where the second and third R process peaks come from. So that is telling us there's something more. And what is more is looking at mergers. We still haven't looked at that. There can be mergers between neutron stars, neutron stars and black holes. And that is my next slide. So coming back to one of the previous slides, we still haven't looked at these two objects within this box. So that's what we did next. We uh, looked at black hole neutron stars. So this is roughly a schematic of how the ejecta looks for a black hole neutron star merger. So there are a lot of things which are happening here. There's a jet which is going out, there's a cocoon, there's the accretion disk in purple, and there's a dynamical ejecta in yellow. So most of the nucleosynthesis that happens doesn't happen in the jet or the cocoon. It happens in these two components, which is the dynamical ejecta and the wind. So the next thing that we did is we put into Skynet the initial conditions for those two components, and then we saw the abundance patterns, and we got this. So for, this is the binary neutron star in red, this is the black hole neutron star in red. It's only showing dynamical ejecta, but as you can see, you can get first R process peak, which is 60, second R process peak, which is 130, third R process peak, which is 190, and also some actinides, which was not happening in case of core collapse. So merger is actually pushing the boundaries a bit. And here, this panel is uh, comparing core collapse, magnetorotational versus thermal, a uh, neutrino-driven core collapse. So as we see, the green curve is something that we have already seen before. We were seeing peaks at 60, peaks at 90, but cannot go more than 100. But now when we add blue, which is magnetorotational core collapse, we add red, BNS, we add black, BHNS. Now we see that these abundances can extend up to 130, 140. So it's definitely giving us nuclei, which we were not seeing earlier, gold, platinum, heavier nuclei, which we know exist in the earth, but which core collapse said, okay, we cannot produce it. But merger does say that 
there's a chance of having it. And it tells us that merger is the missing component that we had. We had to add that to nucleosynthesis and get the full picture done. So coming back to this periodic table now, we haven't generated this periodic table again, but what we have done is we have added black hole neutron star mergers and we, we have added magnetorotational supernovae in this. So now this picture, we are in the process of building this again. Now it looks very different from what it, it, it looked here because with, with red, there's added component of magnetorotational supernova. With uh, magenta, there's a added component of black hole neutron star. So if we were to plot this again, this wouldn't look like the 2020 version. And that was the goal of our work to actually verify if this has a difference or not. Now I'm moving towards the last part of the talk. So we also had to look at, yeah. It's the post-merger ejector, which is either the dynamical ejector or the wind driven uh, outflow, which is participating in the nucleosynthesis. So it is uh, once the two neutron stars merge or the neutron star merges with a black hole, we lose the identity of the initial uh, matter in those stars. What we have is a post merger <coughs> remnant and then outflow from that remnant. So in that outflow, in the figure that I showed, there is jet, there is cocoon, there is dynamical ejector, and there's accretion disk. So nucleosynthesis is happening in two of them, dynamical ejector and wind from the accretion disk. That is in a similar phase, slightly later than GRB phase. GRB, the prompt emission is a little bit earlier than that, but this uh, is more overlapping with the kilonova phase, which is few hours to days. Absolutely. Yes. So in the propagation, we looked at three different progenitors for stars. Yes. If you use gravitational waves as triggers and then we follow up and we can actually observe it, yes, that's a possibility. Yes, but it, it hasn't been done until now up to the best of my knowledge because uh, these triggers are also easy to miss. These, these can be... Uh, so the sky coverage, and uh, once you are focusing on that part of the sky, it's kind of hard to say which galaxy or which region of the galaxy it's exactly coming from. Not every band is created the same. So radio, gamma ray, X-ray, it can be difficult in different bands. So please go ahead. Just... So it's a uh, it's a challenging task at present, but it's going to improve in the future. In this decade itself, we believe. <laughs> So in propagation uh, of these nuclei, we consider three different progenitors, wolf Wright stars, blue supergiants, and red supergiants, WR, BSG, and RSG. wolf Wrights are stars which are stripped off their uh, outer envelope, so they end at around 10 to the 11th centimeter. Uh, blue supergiants and red supergiants are more extended. They go until 10 to the 12 or 10 to the 13 centimeters. And the jet propagates through that ejecta, which is stellar ejecta is in blue here, the jet can either be collimated or uncollimated. If it's uncollimated, then it looks more conical, which is the middle panel. This is the jet. And if it's collimated, then it looks more like a cylindrical shape, which is the right panel. So we will find that most of our outflows are looking like this. And that would be in the next couple of slides. So one question that we want to ask is, as the jet is moving out of the stellar ejecta, how much energy is deposited into the cocoon? So the cocoon is, this orange region. So how much uh, energy is the yellow jet putting into the orange cocoon is the question that we are answering. And we find that it is progenitor dependent. So going from left to right, wolf right to blue supergiant and red supergiant, you can see that these are contour plots. So the same pattern for all of them. Stronger magnetic field, more rapid rotation means more energy deposited. But as you move from WR to BSG to RSG, you find one order of magnitude increase in each because the breakout time for red supergiant is greater than blue supergiant. It's a much larger stellar progenitor as we saw in the density curve. So there's more time for the jet to deposit energy into the cocoon. That is 
giving us 10 to the 50 instead of 10 to the 49 and 10 to the 51 instead of 10 to the 50 here. So that's one result that we established. The next one is whether this jet is getting choked in the stellar medium or not. And that depends on the energy ratio of the jet and the ejector. So this expression is actually, this integral is the jet luminosity. E dot J is the jet luminosity basically. And we are integrating it up to the breakout time. And this is how much energy is there in the cocoon. So if jet uh, energy, net energy in the jet is larger than the cocoon energy, then it breaks out. If it's not, if this ratio is less than one, then it doesn't break out. So we plot this ratio, which is energy in the jet over energy in the ejector. And we found that this ratio is less than one only for Wolfride, less than three times 10 to the 15. So this blue region, the rest of this is all greater than one. So this is one, this is 10. So we find that these jets are not getting choked in red supergiants, which is the right panel. In blue supergiants, they're only getting choked for a very small parameter space in Wolfred, which is this one. And the last part of our calculation was to actually answer the question if there can be neutrinos from these systems or not. So as we discussed, the dominant part of the energy in these outflows, because they, these are protomagnetars, these outflows are uh, dominated by magnetic dissipation. And because the particle temperatures are high, we saw that nuclei are getting disintegrated into free neutrons. We saw that photo disintegration and spallation optical depth is much larger than one. So hydrogen, helium, carbon, oxygen, whatever is in the close by material of the star, if it comes close to the outflow, then it will just break into lighter elements. So what happens is these protons are interacting with the ambient photons, these photons are coming out of the jet uh, through the termination shock. And these photons get thermalized over time and they are generating neutrons through photopion interaction. So P gamma is photopion interaction. And the question is if we can see high energy neutrinos. By high energy, I mean energy is greater than one TV or not. So imagine this being the source and this is where we are. Uh, the proton is interacting with photons. It's generating a neutrino, which is this line. And the photon is traveling independently, which is a GRB, a gamma ray burst. And then there, are, there can be cosmic ray signals and other signals. The question is whether do we have the gray line or not? Whether do we see the neutrino or not? So to answer that, again, we compared all three progenitors. In green is Wolfride, blue is blue supergiant, red is red supergiant. As you will see, Stronger field, so there are three configurations. One is 10 to the 16, strong field, rapid rotation. This is the weakest field, slower rotation. So solid line, which is the strongest field, most energetic configuration, it's giving us the largest flux. And the flux is larger for red supergiant than it is for blue supergiant, than it's for Wolfride. So red curve is higher energy. It is peaking around 10 to the 7 GeV. Blue curve is speaking around 10 to the 5 GeV, and the green curve is speaking around 10 to the 3 GeV. So, Wolfride has more promise, uh, has less promise to be detected because the flux is so much smaller. Red supergiant has the most promise for getting detected. And there's an exponential suppression at the higher end, which is most prominent in red supergiant. And there's a spectral break below the peak, which is at the highest energy for red supergiant. The, it's breaking here. For blue supergiant, it's breaking there. For Wolfrad, it's breaking at a smaller energy. So that's a trend. But the next question is, yes. Yes, that's, that's the assumption that we made here. We say that all of them contribute equally to the flux. Mm -hmm. This is the, uh, okay, the unit is converted compensating for the distance. So this is at a distance of 100 megaparsec. Yeah. So that would be in the next slide. I, I convert this to fluence and then that fluence is converted to number. So I'll, I'll just move to that. Uh, the neutrino fluence is the neutrino flux integrated until the breakout time. And the neutrino uh, fluence is looking like that. For Wolfrad, the fluence is about 10 to the 3, 10 to the 4. For blue supergiants, it's here. For red supergiants, it's the most. So we find that uh, 
neutrinos are detectable for optimistic blue supergiant uh, cases. Red supergiant cases, they are mostly detectable. It's very hard to detect them for wolf ride because they are dying out so quickly. Uh, the numbers that we were talking about is coming from this integral. So the number depends on the energy integral, including the effective area and multiplying by the neutrino flux. And what we see is for wolf ride, the number is always less than one. So we pretty much do not get any neutrino, neutrinos from wolf rides. From blue supergiants, if the energetically, uh, the configuration is energetically the largest, 10 to the 16 one, then we see about 13 neutrinos. For blue supergiants, we get about 50. So the likelihood, the promise for getting neutrinos is the most for red supergiants, more extended progenitors, less attenuation, larger flux, larger fluence, larger numbers. That is going to be produced at the source. And then uh, when we propagate the code, which is the step that we are doing right now with CR Propa, we will find out how many of those 13 are eventually reaching Earth. So this is still a upper bound in that sense. Thirteen at hundred megaparsecs. Right. Right. No, that's that's the most optimistic that all thirteen would arrive. So. Without considering the process. Yes, for, for arrival at Earth. Right. Arrival at Earth is fine. Mm -hmm. for, the for the detection. Right, mm -hmm. right. So this was pretty much uh, the end result in this talk. We talked about whether neutrinos can be generated more in which of these progenitors, wolf red, blue supergiant, red supergiant, and as a function of B and P, what's the most optimistic case? And what's the largest number of neutrinos that we can get? We saw that we can get about 10, about 50. Uh, very optimistic assumptions in some cases, but uh, this is the result that we get at 400 megaparsec. It may not be 100, it may be larger, then the number would be smaller. It scales as d to the minus two, roughly. So, Again, uh, what I said, neutrinos are only detectable for most energetic outflows for BSGs. They are almost always detectable for red supergiants. Uh, the number of events is about a few tens, uh, above one TV. And I'll summarize quickly. I have talked about nucleosynthesis first. What we looked at was uh, nuclei that are heavier than I, uh, then iron can be produced in outflows from protomagnetars, but we saw them as a function of magnetic field and rotation rate, spin period. We found that if there's more rapid rotation, but if the field is not very large, then there's more promise to get heavier nuclei, but we still couldn't go beyond A equals 60 for core collapse. That is one thing we found out. Then we wanted to ask whether the nuclei, whatever is getting synthesized can survive, they can get accelerated or not, we found there's a certain region, that wide region in the energy versus optical depth plot, where the nuclei is also getting accelerated to 10 to the 20, 21 EV, and the optical depth is also less than one. So they are getting, they are surviving within the outflow and they're also getting energetically accelerated. So they are cosmic rays in that sense. Then our process goes on in both core collapse and merger scenarios, but Core collapse is predominantly explaining first our process peak. So uh, core collapse is predominantly explaining first our process peak, but BNS and BHNS mergers are helping us in explaining second and third our process peak and the actinides. So uh, it's a way of bringing both of them together and explaining the periodic theory because we know there, there are second, third R process peak, there's actinides, much heavier nuclei that we see in the earth. And then talking about propagation, these jets, when they are moving in the stellar ejector, they remain uncollimated. They are not getting collimated because they are so energetic. Uh, we find that they break out of the ejector successfully and they are also remaining stable 
until the time that they are breaking out. So there can be magneto rotational instabilities within the outflow, but that is not breaking the magnetized jet apart. It stays like that until the time it breaks out. And then neutrinos with energy larger than one TeV can be produced uh, within these outflows. And we can see between one to 10 or 50 neutrino events, depending on whether we are looking at blue supergiants or red supergiants, what distances they are uh, and so on. So that is pretty much the summary of my talk. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you for, uh, for your attention and would be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mukul. So, time for questions. So, questions. We already had quite a few questions. So, yes. Uh, I think never thought of this kind of sources are also very promising for uh, detection like OZ. Yes. Because they're high energy positive rays and mm -hmm. they only use much deflection up to even 100 mega per second. So, never mm -hmm. thought of. Uh, that we hadn't looked at that yet, no. But yeah, but you are saying there wouldn't be considerable deflection. So if, no, if they are, yeah, the mm -hmm. mean peak up to Okay, so yeah, yeah. So that's yeah, that's definitely an interesting point. This is something we should look at because we are looking at about hundred megaparsecs. So. You said like you are not taking into that for the WSX or anything. Mm -hmm. So maybe I'd like to know later on like how much you consider this better effect, how the numbers change. How those numbers change. Yes. That is something we will do. CCS and apart from any WSX, mm -hmm. I think maybe uh we also look into this fast oscillation, asymmetric oscillation. Mm -hmm. That could also be important in uh, such high dense environments. It eventually for neutrino detection. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Really good points. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Marcy. So uh, I have a few questions. Um, so can I go to the periodic table? Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, so, so the next one. The, yes. yes. So you said that there is a time evolution, hmm. but in some cases, it hasn't reached to the top yet. So what does that mean? Yes, it means that out of all five cases, let's say for beryllium or boron, these five cases are not explaining the abundances that we see. So that's the... That's in some way the missing gap that we are trying to fill is if there's anything else other than these five processes, which is explaining the, the abundance that we see, but what is not getting here in the periodic table. So that is magnetorotational core collapse supernova and black hole neutron star mergers. So that actually gives us that abundance, which is entirely white here. It's not entirely white, we know. I mean, there are some others. In... So other elements as well, yeah. Okay. And uh, can you go to the first uh, conflict uh, plot that you're going for? Yeah. The time period in magnetic field into axis. Uh, <clears throat> so you mean for magnetization? Yeah, that was the very first conflict plot. That you so this one. Yeah. Yeah. So um, this one. Okay. Um, so for, first of all, the magnetic field is going, you are showing up to 3 times 10 to the power 16. Hmm. And where does it start? I mean, what is your starting point? Uh, so it's 3 times 10 to the 14. Because it's a linear axis, it's not very uh, clear. But two orders of magnitude. Yeah. So that's yeah. because magnetars are supposed to have the yeah, minimum field. field around that. Okay. And so when you are saying, say, for uh, your DED, hmm. that, so we, we know that that depends on the time period and the magnetic field some d squared or some something like that. So yeah. is there anything? So um, so this e dot is uh, proportional to sigma zero, right? The sigma zero right. has phi b square, phi b has b. So this right. becomes b square. So I, I'm just trying to understand if I mean in the norm, normal sort of pulsar. Uh, energy uh, luminosity. Mm -hmm. This kind of expressions come up. So, mm -hmm. 
Is there anything special here or is it just that? It's, it's the same physical expressions that we use. We just get E dot, we can push E dot to slightly higher range, 10 to the so B. B is high, yes. By tuning B accordingly, we get there. So um, now coming to this high value of B, so um, I mean, is there, um, so you are essentially saying that in presence of 10 to the power 14 to 16 gauss of magnetic field, some additional nuclear processes will happen, which would not happen in, say, 10 to the power 8 gauss. At, at those small, so even if those processes are happening at smaller fields, uh, we are saying that, uh, okay, so I talked about recombination. So recombination is important for heavy element nucleosynthesis. The temperature has to be less than a certain threshold, uh, about 10 to the 9 Kelvin or so for recombination to happen. So if the field is too large or too low, such that the temperature is larger than the recombination temperature, whatever gets formed through nucleosynthesis breaks down very quickly. So whatever parameter space is allowing us to get the temperature below the recombination temperature would give us nucleosynthesis. But is it also giving us enough energy as we see in cosmic rays is the other component in the question. So if we reduce B, our energy is decreasing. Maybe we get nucleosynthesis, but we are not getting the energy we want. If we get Bs to a certain high extent, then we get both nucleosynthesis and the energy up to the cosmic ray range. So it's like a it's like the optimal range where we want so to. So the go. high magnetic field essentially is in some in some form it is pro providing additional energy. Yes. That's what's mm -hmm. um, so how common are um, ma magnetar? I mean, I'm, I'm a little confused by when you're saying. This can happen in blue supergiants or red supergiants. You mean mm. that during core collapse of those? Yeah. So, um, and I mean, what controls whether that will become a magnetar or just a simple? Oh, uh, so that the the mass dependent evolution after core collapse. So, if the core is uh, much heavier than uh, let's say 1.4 solar mass, it will eventually collapse to a black hole. It wouldn't become right. a neutron no, star. I'm saying whether it will be a magnetar or it's a, or a pulsar, for example. Or mm. So we, we are not very sure about the magnetic field evolution. And magnetars no. are relatively rare. Rarer. Rarer. It's a few percent at most, 10 percent. Mm -hmm. Neutron stars or pulsars. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, so, so, then there is some... so there is room for including the rate of these events because that has to match the observational rate. And if once we include the rate of these events and still get nucleosynthesis, nuclei abundances, which we can match with solar and ultra metal core stars or any other kinds of stars, if the abundance numbers are matching, the y axis is matching, then we also can constrain the rate. We can say yes. if all of it is coming from them, then the rate has to be at least this much. Okay. Yeah. Or is it? Yeah. So my question is related to what uh, you were answering just a minute. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you go to that uh, periodic table, the uh, modified periodic table, including the PNS uh, event. Yeah. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for some elements, uh, I mean, the contribution oh. from binary neutron star merger is quite high. Uh, for example, uh, antimony, I can see it is quite high. Yes. So, I mean, abundance of antimony, uh, can, we, can it be used as a proxy for, I mean, the DNS events to time, or maybe we can put a constraint on the DNS number of DNS events? Whichever nuclei has, yes, uh, let's say the largest abundance from a single event can be used as a prior to constrain the event rate for that particular kind of scenario. Yeah. So let's say antimony for neutron star mergers. Yeah, no, I mean, so I mean, the next generation detectors that will be coming on that will be seeing more, many more events, uh, like, I mean, like, yeah. so has anything <coughs> of this sort been done? trying to use uh, these numbers to put additional constraints? With, uh, as far as I know, with LIGO, up to LIGO 03, not yet. But I know uh, people are looking at it uh, with like for LIGO 04, 
which would be operational sometime later this year. So because it also depends on the uh, distance, horizon distance up to which we can see these, right? So there is a gravitational horizon distance, there's a e EM horizon distance. So if the EM horizon distance is much larger than the gravitational horizon distance, we are missing some of these events in the EM space. The other way we are almost covering all of them. So with O2 to O3 to O4, we are pushing the GW horizon. But the question is, are we there yet that we are beyond the EM horizon? And that will happen with O4. It didn't happen with O3. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, sir, for the awesome talk. Uh, yes. My question is kind of a basic need one uh, that uh, how will the situation change if these uh, jets are interacting with the industrial medium or the nearby particles? Mm -hmm. uh, what would be the observable or the detectable changes that we could measure? Okay, so the uh, composition would change as a result mm -hmm. because there would be uh, interaction with nuclei within the ISM. So then we have to again ask the question, what is the optical depth for those interactions? If they are larger than one or if they are less than one? If it's less than one, uh, essentially in two limits, if it's much less than one, then the interaction is very weak. Then the composition is not changing. Then the energies are not changing. But, but if it's somewhere between, let's say, 10 to 100 or even larger, then we have to uh, add those interactions and we have to recalculate the energy. We have to recalculate the abundance and we... That is something that we are uh, including in the propagation code, propagation to the earth, and that's a different code that's called CR proper. So right now we are still close to the protomagnetar 10 to the 5 kilometers, like I showed 100,000 kilometers, but that has to go beyond 10 to the 5 kilometers. It has to be 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9. Yeah, 100 megaparsec. Yeah, so that is the next step. Uh, it is difficult to model because... It's a large distance scale, much larger length scale, uh, time scale. So it takes very long to run those simulations. So that is uh, in the works right now, but we will see the first results in a couple of months, hopefully. Yeah, thanks for the question. Okay. <clears throat> Any other questions from the audience? So if not, I have like two questions. Hmm. The first one is related to the <clears throat> periodic table itself. So the abundance since that we have seen here, all these blue, green things, is it theoretical or is it theoretical, right? These are theoretical estimates uh, from those events. Right. Yes. So now my question is that if I want to test, like, and so what are the observational things that we can do to see that, okay, the periodic table that we're drawing from these theoretical models mm -hmm. are actually making sense or they are sort of correct. So we can get the abundance patterns from the stars that we can observe. Sun is one example. There are other stars from which we can get uh, abundance patterns from their uh, uh, spectrum. And we can match them against whatever distribution is here in the periodic yeah. table. Yeah, so I, maybe, maybe the question was too general. So for example, let's say if I want to concentrate on BBN abundances, mm -hmm. right? Now, yeah, um, hydrogen helium, that's not a not that a, that a huge issue. Mm -hmm. Although isotopes of helium might be issues. But for example, the lithium abundance, the primordial lithium abundance, or even the primordial boron abundance. So mm -hmm. how do we I mean, because I, I mean my knowledge is very very limited in this area, but I have, I have, I have heard or I have, I have read that there are large uncertainties in that because how do you actually go and differentiate that uh, the abundances are primordial or the or the, uh, or evolution? So, so it, it would be. I mean, we are talking about like four or five processes. There is mm -hmm. a type one, a super, there's a core collapse, supernova. There are neutron star mergers. There are AGB stars. Mm -hmm. So. Then the question comes is that when it comes to observational constraints, there we are seeing okay, how much boron is there in the universe, let's say. Mm -hmm. What are there any ways that we can differentiate that this boron is coming from this fraction is coming from this process, this fraction is coming from observation? At this point, when <clears> you <throat> see uh, 
the observational abundance, there isn't a way to distinguish to, to the best of my knowledge. So what we see is the uh, hysteresis or, or the accumulated effect in yes. the end. We do not know where it started from or if it was synthesized, then disintegrated, then again synthesized or not. So we are losing the history of it. Uh, that's one problem. What we are seeing is, okay, what has happened at time T? but it hasn't told us how it evolved until time t. That's right. So, yeah. so then, uh, I would, if you, I'd be interested if you know that if something equivalent to the Kobayashi 2020 plot, mm -hmm. if there is something equivalent in the observational sector, I mean, yes. is there something, some picture, some diagram equivalent to that? that uh, not one that I've to... found of from, from observational uh, data points, yeah. yes. But that is something I'll, I'll look up and I can get back. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. The second, I think maybe I missed a bit. So when we're talking about the bullfrog stars and the blue super, the nucleus, you know, mm -hmm. can you go to that slide? Yeah. So maybe I missed something. So I, I think the conclusion was that the uh, sources were highest from the blue super giants. Am I, am I right? Yeah. Uh, the neutrinos, uh, the fluence of the neutrinos is highest for the red supergiant. So the red, the red, red supergiants. Blue supergiant is about two, three orders of magnitude, lower peak, red supergiants again, two, three orders of magnitude. Yeah, so, so then I think the question is that now if I look at these neutrinos that are coming from these sources, hmm. they will have a spectrum, right? Yes. I'm only talking about very high energy neutrinos, which are greater than TeV energy. Yes, we are we are placing TeV as a cutoff here. So Okay. Uh, we are saying neutrinos with E greater than TV, but yes, we are starting and from the motivation for having this cutoff. Is it from experimental motivation? Why are we interested in um, out here to be with these neutrinos? I mean, why not lower? I mean, is there any motivation oh, so for having this cutoff? Not, not necessarily, mm -hmm. I would say. Uh, we just wanted to explore it because we know that these systems are very energetic in the BNP space, so we wanted to okay. see if. They can get to TeV neutrinos or not but in the first place. But then actually construct the spectrum. Yes. Yeah. For all these processes. Yes. So then my question is that uh, what would be the guiding physics that would determine that, okay, uh, uh, Wolfram would give this energetic neutrinos versus what the super, red supergiants can't or blue supergiants can. So what is mm -hmm. the... Uh, what are the guiding, I mean, what maybe one or two guiding physics principles hmm. that would determine that why would one source produce the, uh, the, the smoking gun, so to say, to distinguish between different yes, yes. progenitors? Because, yeah. I think the reverse question would be that maybe, uh, I mean, of course, there are many ways to study all these uh, involved stellar objects, but just I was curious that. So there's a different neutrino spectrum. When we're talking about neutrino detection, mm -hmm. maybe we can put some constraint on the astrophysics of this object. Right, right, right. So that's why I was curious to know so, what would be the guiding physics that would determine mm -hmm. the neutrino spectrum. So we know, for example, we know, uh, so we have to bring uh, multiple components together. One is neutrinos, the other is cosmic rays. There's also GRBs. We know Wolfrad stars are predominantly GRB sources, not so much super giants. So let's say we see a neutrino, we also see a GRB. Then we can say it's most likely a Wolfrad, not a blue super giant. We just see a neutrino, no GRB, more likely to be super giants. Or in the in the Emax, in the maximum energy range, if we see uh, the spectrum is extending up to a particular energy, we know the Wolfrads cannot reach it. Then it's most likely coming from red supergiants or blue supergiants. So oh. we have to bring all three uh, EM or all three uh, messengers together, make it a multi multi messenger analysis, and put them next to each other, and see that which progenitor is most likely for scenario one versus scenario two versus three. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, our, okay, there's one question. Well, yeah. So yeah. So uh, we haven't looked at gamma ray flux, uh, but yes. Uh, we didn't consider that possibility. No. So uh, th there can be gamma rays. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't say that they are not there. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
there can be it's it's just wasn't a part of our analysis we are looking at cr plus neutrino but then we want to have grb plus cr plus neutrinos and if there's possibility for gws that's the fourth component it's like putting everything in multi messenger together gamma ray flux for these yeah okay so let's thank the speaker again thank you and we have another talk uh, the second colloquium which will be next wednesday at 3 30 pm uh, the exact location the, the room will be announced later but uh, professor Ingram, about that uh, visiting the school of astrophysics we'll talk about uh, physics of the accretion disks uh, relativistic physics in the accretion disk which will be next week's talk Okay, thank you. Sharing the yeah, I'll just... the, uh, text format to, to the exam modifier. Text to modify, which is ideal. Maybe PowerPoint version or different. Okay, by the end. Recording the one. So.